Paul had been given a command by God to go and he was to to destroy the Amalekites, right? And uh, and again, as Saul has always done, is he does a little bit of what God tells him to do. And I shared with you last week, you know, if you if you think about this, you know, uh, partial diso or excuse me, partial obedience is always what disobedience. Yeah, and that's true in Saul's life. That's true in our life. And God just can't can't bless your life. I mean, there, that's the sad reality of it. I mean, in any of our lives, if there if we're just you know halfway in, we're going well, you know, I I come to church, or you know, I I do a Bible study, but you know, um, but yeah, I just I'm not all in. And God, He wants it's all or nothing with the Lord, and that's and and we know that because if you're not all in, you're miserable. I mean, you can you can fake it, but in your heart of hearts, you know, if you're being disobedient to the Lord that it just brings about misery. The, the joy in our life is, is listening to what God tells us to do and honoring the Lord in our life and just being all in with him. You know, I'm going to back it up to verse 10 there, and it says, Now when the word of the Lord it says came to Samuel, saying, Let me do something here. Um, it says, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night long. And the thing I shared with you, and I really appreciate this about Samuel, because he had such a heart for Saul. He wanted Saul to be everything that Saul could be. Uh, Samuel had lived long enough. I mean, he saw potential, just like we all see potential in people. And what a, a sad commentary in our life if we don't live up to our potential that you know again we can there's so much more that we can do but yet what I do love about Samuel is that you know he didn't go about you know backbiting and complaining he wasn't a gossip you know uh, again what did he do he stayed up all night and he wept for Saul he prayed for him you know and if you really want to you know live a, a life that's honoring to God I mean a lot of times people claim to be honoring God but you know you're the judge of your life that and you're not a good judge you know, he's the, he's the judge. I mean, will he find you faithful? And again, he's the one. His word determines, you know, what faithfulness is. But, you know, here's Samuel. He's not complaining even about Saul. He hurt for Saul. And again, that's what the Lord does for us. When he looked out from the cross, what did he do? Did he yell at him? Did he, you know, did he cuss us from the cross? He said, no, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that could have been me. That could have been you. It says, so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told to Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around and passed by and came down to Gilgal. And sad, Saul, again, he builds a monument to himself, not uh, to the Lord here, celebrating his victory. And it says, and then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of God. And again, I put this in my notes. It's not doing our best that matters to God. It's doing what God says matters that is best. So partial obedience is what? Disobedience. Disobedience, okay. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? <laughs> I mean, Sam, have you ever seen a news uh, you know, commentator like at a farm or something and they're trying to report the news and all the animals are going, meh, meh. And the guys, you know, they're looking around, they're going, and we're here, meh. You know, it's like, and here's Saul trying to brag about his victory, and all you got all these sheep going Meh, in the background, and Sam is going, I can't hear you boasting. It just kind of ruins your whole thing when you go, Hey, I want to tell you about how good I am, and then as soon as you start to talk, a bunch of sheep just start going Meh, Meh, and you're just going, Gin. It's like I can't, I can't even get a word in edgewise here, and that's what Samuel is saying. He's going, You know, I can't hear anything that you're trying to say. You know, pride, like I said, and disobedience, it does what? It, it blinds us. It makes us deaf to our own sin. We all have blind spots. You know, that, that's, the, the, I think, the hard part for many of us is not realizing that we have a blind spot in our life. And Saul had a, a tremendous blind spot. And Samuel, he hurt for him. Again, it was his pride and his disobedience. And like I said, it blinded him. It made him deaf. Psalm 139, 23 and 24, David prayed this. And you can see why he was a man after God's own heart. He says, search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Verse 15 goes on. It says, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. You oh, know, man, <laughs> is there a statement there? You had the Lord your God, not my God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. 
And that wasn't true. He, he wasn't even telling the truth here. It says, then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. I'm like, go ahead, yeah, tell me, yeah. I'd like to hear. Maybe God's, he's wanting you to tell me how awesome I am. It says, so Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you uh, king over Israel? What he was saying was, hey, Saul, there was a day when you were humble. There was a day when you didn't think so much of yourself. There was a day when you thought more of God. You know, and there's an understanding, you know, humility brings about productivity. When we're humble, God can use us. When we're not humble, he can't use us. You know, James 4.10 puts it like this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You lift yourself up, God will take you down. Humble yourself, God will lift you up. But people, again, don't want to trust in the Lord. So they take matters into their own hands. That old expression, one in the hands worth two in the bush, because it takes faith to trust God. It says, now the Lord sent you on a mission. He said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Samuel Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. And I brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder. So what, what I mean, it happens as soon as they're, you're confronted with truth, what happens? Yeah, it's like he, deflection, right? If you, if you don't really, you don't understand it so much from this, I would just encourage you to turn on Fox News and watch yesterday's interview in Las Vegas with Hillary Clinton. Um, and it's a great, great thing. Um, they were asking her questions about her server. Man, she, it looked like a tennis match. I mean, she was deflecting everything. It just reminded me of this as I was studying for it. Uh, it says, and... It says, but the people took the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in Gilgal. But again, what was the problem? Just like with Hillary, what's the problem? Saul was consenting. If somebody scrubbed that, that server, uh, she's still responsible. You can't, you can't you know, plead the fifth on that. You know? If you're the official, and she kept stressing that, you know, I'm the official, I'm in charge, I'm the official, you go, be careful. By your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be what? Condemned. And so you look at this, Saul, exactly there, deflection. It was my parents' fault. You know, that's the mantra of the world today, right? My parents raised, I had a terrible upbringing, Pastor Mike, I can't help it. I mean, if you just knew, you know, if you saw my environment, you'd say, man, I turned out really good. You know, you know. I was born this way, you know. I didn't, I, I didn't want to have these affections. God placed them. It, it's God's fault that I am that I am, said Popeye. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of the rams. Again, partial obedience is what? It's disobedience. Yeah, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. Yeah. I mean, people give to charity to do what? Yeah, relieve their guilt. So just because you give something doesn't mean that it's a heart or an attitude of love. Again, we do things often just to ease a guilty conscience. But God wants us to have a clean heart. It says, for rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as inequity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So he's talking about here rebellion is, is what? It's, it's defiant. It's self-dependence here. It's equal you know, with anything that's outward in wickedness here. It's because why? It's the opposite of, of trusting God. See, witchcraft is divination. And so, again... It, what we're saying in the practice of divination is, I don't need you, God. I, I'm spiritual. I'll, I'll, I'll divine myself. You know, I'll find the answer myself. I'll decide what's best for me. And that's what Saul was practicing. He practiced the occult. He didn't practice the presence of God. People claim to be spiritual. And they say, oh, what does it matter as long as you're, you're praying, as long as you're seeking? And you go, well, uh, there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And God has clearly mapped out the right way through his word to seek him first, his kingdom and his righteousness. Then it says, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And again, what is he declaring here? If you read this carefully and you read this slowly, Saul was more concerned about what? What the people thought than what God thought. 
And you know what? And that's how it is for many of us. We're more concerned about pleasing people than we are pleasing the Lord. It says, Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And you think, why would Samuel say no? Because worship involves sacrifice, right? And what would Saul be offering as the sacrifice but the very animals that God told them not to take? So could that even have been a true sacrifice? No, he's saying obedience is better than sacrifice. And so Samuel knows. He knows that that will not be an offering that, that, is, that is acceptable in the sight of God. And so he doesn't go. It says, and as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. Man, you talk about a, a vivid object lesson here because what was ha taking place was the kingdom was being torn from him. There's a great lesson, life lesson for all of us here. You know, it's the whole life loosely. Saul's pride got the best of him. He was unwilling to relinquish control. And man, if you're doing that, you're holding on too tight, you're trying to be in control, guess what? It'll eventually get ripped out of your hand. Why? Because Jesus modeled perfectly the, the life that we're called to live. No greater love than any man than this, than he what? Lay down his life. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, the Bible says, what? It remains alone. But if it dies, it bears fruit. It produces something. See, Jesus laid his life down. Saul refused to. It was about self-preservation. It's like, you know, self, it's just security. You know, our security is not in this world, amen? Our security is in God. It said, so Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor, that'll be David, it says, of yours, who is better than you. That, that hurts. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. He's still getting it wrong. He's still con more concerned about what other people think, how he appears to them and not how he appears to God. It says, so Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. So he's thinking, okay, wait, great, well, you know, uh, that's, it's all behind us now. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so your, shall your mother be childless amongst women. And Samuel hacked Agag into pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of, of Saul, and says, and Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death, Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. What a sad, sad ending to his life. Chapter 16 goes on in verse 1. It says, And now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. You know, and Samuel, he, like I said, he's sad. I mean, he's mourning over, over Saul. I mean, to think that, you know, you've you got to put yourself in Samuel's position. You know, that his mother took him and gave him to Eli. And he saw the failure of Eli's life, right? And he saw the failure of Eli's sons. He saw the corruption. He saw the nation of Israel who didn't even want God as a king. They wanted an earthly king. And his heart's just been broken and broken. And all of a sudden, here's Saul, this first king. And Samuel's going, well, maybe this is it. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is where we get around the corner here, you know. And then what happens? So much potential, you know, that he sees him. But Saul doesn't listen. Doesn't listen to God. He's not obedient to the things that God's called him to. And so what does he do? He sees his God reject him as king. And it just breaks his heart. Like I said, it's, it's not one of those things where he, at his age, I mean, he was obviously mature in his faith, and yet he's heartbroken. It reminds me of Jesus himself looking out over Jerusalem and weeping. Where he says, you know, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, you know, how I've longed to gather you up like a mother hen does her chicks. But they rejected him. And there's a pain that comes with it. Not a, not a, there's a righteous anger, but more than anything else, it's a broken heart. And we know that from the cross because ultimately, you know, when they pierce Jesus' side, both water and blood come out. You know, we realize that, you know, 
Science tells us that what took place was his heart burst within him. A broken heart. And again, you look at your own life and you look at the ministry today. You know, what goes on in the world and it can be really discouraging. I mean, if you really think about this, you go, how many people do you really know in, in Christendom that have been faithful to the end? I mean, started faithful and just walked with God and were faithful all the days of their life. And there might be a handful. You, you could be that one. But we just see, you know, that again, all the time, you know, people go for a season of time, they walk with God, and then boom, they fall off. And you go, and it's so sad, and it breaks your heart. But one of the things that we have to understand when the Lord says this, and he says, you know, Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? What is, he, what is he declaring there? He's going, you know, men will fail you. Men will let you down. He goes, but I still have a plan. The plans of God, man, they never fail. They, they will never come to an end. God will fulfill all of his purposes. And so should we be looking to man? Should we be looking to woman? No, we should be looking to God. And if you'll keep your eyes you know, on the Lord and you'll keep seeking him and serving him, you, he won't let you down. You know, we'll let one another down, but God will never let you down. And it says in verse 2, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, obviously, if Saul knew what, what Samuel was doing, he would see that as treason, right? I mean, you're anointing another king while there's still a king. doesn't go over really well. And Saul, we know from his life, if you study this out, he's very suspicious of everybody, right? And you go, and that's, and again, what's in your heart? is how you see. That's why Jesus said, you know, it's, it's always amazing. You know, like I said, people in the church, they start looking around, they go, you know, I, let me tell you about that person. I know, I know what kind of person they are. You go, how do you know? They just got here. Because I, I know. God's given me the gift of discernment. You go, no, he's given you a critical spirit because you have a critical spirit about in yourself. And so, you, you know, again, you, you pick that out. Like kind attracts like kind. In, in every way in the life of the church. I mean, you'll find it. I mean, people that love Jesus, they hang out together. People that love themselves hang out together. People that love, you know, whatever. They, it, it's amazing. You know, the, is, it, is the church full of clicks and clacks? And you go, absolutely. People will find that group that they fit in it. You know, the busybodies, man, isn't it amazing? Go to any church. You, you can find the busybodies right away, right? I mean, all you have to do is you find one and, they, and you look. And if you find out you know, who the church gossip is, and you look at, they run in a circle, and you'll find that you'll, all you have to do, then you go to that place, and you just go on Facebook, and you'll see, you know, you can go on whatever their accounts they have, social media, and you'll, you'll see it, and you go, and what do you do? You know, you stay away, <laughs> you go, whatever, whatever you do, what, and it's one of those things where, uh, here's Saul, he's looking around, he, he's so, and you go, why? Because he's got an evil heart, and so he thinks the e evil of everything, and again, that's why we need to, like David, go, Lord, search me and know me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and do what? You know, wash me and cleanse me. Create in me what? As Psalm 51 would declare, a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit. God loves to do that. But this scene here, it kind of makes me laugh because when, when you read it there, you know, here's Samuel telling God, you know, God, how can I go? Saul hears it. He's going to kill me. And it's like God's going, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, and it's not what he's doing at all if you read this in context, because if you go to the next verse, it's almost like what happened was Samuel interrupted God, right? He cut him off, and, stayed, and were, if he hadn't said anything, if you read this in context, he would have said, you know, take the, the heifer, he says, then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. God already knows. That's the beauty of it, church. God already knows what we have need before we even ask, but we should ask. So there's not a problem here. He just says, then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said. He went to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? See, they understand the wrath of God, right? I mean, when the boss shows up, what happens? Everybody panics, right? I mean, it was, it was amazing. I remember being in the beverage business, and I, I worked for Pepsi-Cola for a number of years, and when the big boss would come from New York, from PepsiCo, oh, man. It was like the, the, our owner would come in and go, all right, nobody say anything. It's because if you don't say anything, then you can't really get in trouble, right? You just listen. They go, don't, if they, they go, what if they ask us questions? Don't answer. 
Don't say anything. Because what happens is, I'll just tell you a little secret, when the, when the, when the owners of the company come from New York, they want to go out into the trade and make sure that their product is what? Present everywhere, right? So when they get to your you know, franchise, what do you do? You take them to the stores where you have favor, right? You take them to the few stores that you have where they have your product, not your competition and all that. Well, when the owners come out, they usually, they're smart. That's how they get those jobs. They go, well, what's the furthest away area that uh, you guys cover? And we go, uh, that would be uh, Ridgecrest. I'd like to go to Ridgecrest. Oh, no, it's hot out there. It's like 125. Well, has your car got air conditioning? Yeah. Well, what does it matter? Well, because you do not want to go to Ridgecrest, right? Because when was the last time you had a truck go to Ridgecrest? And you're going, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And they have this, this feeling. They're going, oh, man, if God, oh, if, I mean, who's going to go to Bethlehem? And they're coming there. They're, they're thinking, we, we are going down for the count. And so he answers, though, he says, and we he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons, invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at um, Eliab and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, and, and the, you think, you think Samuel would know this, right? Man does what? We're going to read this. Man looks at the outward appearance. But God looks upon the heart. You go, man, you'd think that he's walked with God long enough. Here's the oldest son. Oh, is there he is? And he says, nope, surely the Lord's anointing is before him. Nope, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his height or his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I always love when Christians, I can see their heart. Really? Oh, I know their heart. It's wicked, you know. Yeah. You know that old expression, you know, that you learn more about the person doing the talking than the one that they're doing the talking about. And it's so, so true. You know, but you, you need to highlight that in your Bible. I mean, even Samuel, he makes this mistake. He's looking at the outward appearance. How many times have you looked at the outward appearance of things? You know, did you hear all sides before you act? You know, most people don't. It's, oh, uh, I trust them. No. Okay. So Jesse called Abinadab and says, made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. He mentioned Samuel. He's like, dang it. Says, then, and he's like, this is not working. Then Jesse made uh, Shama, uh, Shama, well, I guess, how do you want to say that? Pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. <laughs> Imagine how Samuel had to feel now they're all done he's like I have I used to hear God you know you're to, he's got to be thinking I missed it God must have he must have said it and I just wasn't paying attention it says and Samuel said to Jesse are, are, are all the young men here it says then he said yeah there remains the youngest he's basically saying yeah we got to the run of the, the mill is out in the he's out in the field but you know what if if if, if his brothers weren't any good for it, I can tell you right now the kid out in the out in the field he's not going to impress you at all it says, and there he is keeping the sheep, which was the lowest of the lowest jobs. I mean, to be a, a shepherd was not a place of dignity. Uh, again, it was, you know, anybody can be a shepherd. It says, and Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. And it's sad because what does it tell us about Jesse as a father? He doesn't see any potential in his son. Man, how many dads look at their kids on the outward appearance of things and miss, miss, a godsend. See, the Bible says, train your children in the way they should go, not the way you think they should go, that when they're old, they won't depart from it, that you would love your kids enough to understand and, and begin to seek God on their behalf and know their natural bend, the way God created them, and then to be able to encourage them and come alongside and help them grow towards God in their life, to fulfill His purpose and His plan. And again, He's even overlooked and again, I want to stress this because maybe you're here and growing up you were overlooked by your earthly father. But I can tell you this, you are not overlooked by your heavenly father. He has loved you with an everlasting love. You are the apple of his eye. I mean, so much so that he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. You are a priceless treasure, his word declares. And he has something very spectacular for you if you will trust him and you'll look to him. 
So even when nobody else notices, guess what? God is always noticing. He's always paying attention. He knows where we're at all the time. And I think it's so comforting to know that. And says, so he sent and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. Uh, ruddy, who's, he kind of had reddish skin, probably, you know, um, been out in the sun maybe a little bit uh, long and have you get that red hue to your uh, pigment in your skin. It says, and the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. You know, we have these little tiny things of anointing oil. You know, you'll come up on a Sunday if you and I'll anoint you with oil and it might make a little tiny drip, you know, on you. And people are it's like, I mean, trust me, if I did what they did in, in Old Testament and New Testament times, uh, you'd sue me because it would ruin your clothes. I mean, it would cover you from head to toe. You know, Psalm 133 talks about the anointing, how the unity of the brethren, how it's like the oil coming down off Aaron's beard and it's dripping down. I mean, it would just, you'd be drenched from, it'd be like watching one of those shows, you know, on TV where they pour yucky stuff on them and it's just like, it just oozes all over you. And that's exactly how it would be. There's no mistaking. The beauty of it, and I love it because it's a great picture. There's no mistaking the anointing. See, sometimes you go, I wonder if I'm anointed or not. You go, I feel a little oil drop. You know, and you go, is that, did, hey, you guys, you know, is, is that the anointing of God? You know, you, you would have missed this, man. It just been, it just, you know, all over you. And it says, and he anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, I love this because the, the anointing of God, the Holy Spirit came upon him. What did he do? Did he speak in tongues? Did he prophesy? No, he walked away dripping. <laughs> he didn't say anything. Nothing happened. There was no like, you know, no, no, his brothers didn't go. I mean, he's just like... Nothing said. He's just, it was for another day. But it's an, it's an amazing thing, you know, when you think about that. I mean, <laughs> God has a purpose. God has a plan. It says, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So at this very moment, this same time, this, we see this in the Old Testament a lot because really and there's, there is expressions where the Holy Spirit, you know, fell on 70 or on a council and more than one. But for the most part, when the Holy Spirit moved in the Old Testament, went from person to person to person. So when the Holy Spirit was with Saul, then God took the Spirit from Saul, gave him to David, so then it departed from Saul. And it says, it departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And again, you go, now, when you think about this, it's cause and effect. It's not that God sent personally a distressing spirit that when you don't have the spirit of God you can say that what is going to happen in your life is you're going to experience distress many people I love when they come to Jesus what happens in their life they experience a peace right we talk about being at peace with God and experiencing the peace of God well obviously Saul no longer had a relationship if he ever had a relationship with God which most likely he really didn't we just read the text there and follow his life and so when the Holy Spirit left, and, and then the other thing that we, we misunderstand from the Old Testament was God anointed people for many tasks in the Old Testament who weren't believers. We think of the Holy Spirit being in a believer's life because we see that in, in the book of Acts, right? Well, in the Old Testament, when God could be using anybody, but whatever he, whoever he used, he anointed them for that purpose in that moment. And then when he was done, he took his spirit away to demonstrate that it wasn't even in their own strength. It was always in God's power that God got his will done on earth. And so as you read through this, you know, bear that in mind. It says, when a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him, and Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful player on the harp, and it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. What is his servants doing here? They're dealing with what? The symptoms. They're not dealing with the cause. What was the cause? An unrepentant heart, sin. That's what, that's what creates the stress. Think about your own life. You go, where does the real stress come from? It comes from not, is, what, why, is, is you know, worry, is that sin? You go, yeah, because what's the opposite? Trusting God. When you're not trusting God, then you, you have to worry. You go, and it's sin all the time. It's not like, a, so what do we do? We get rid of it. 
Saul needed to repent. And if he had repented, what would have happened? And that distressing spirit would have left and he would experience the peace of God. But he's going, you know, that, you know, the world's always looking for another way, right? Instead of just turning to God, you know. So then it's like, okay, turn on the radio. Yeah, turn on the radio. Do you know some people, and it's so sad. I mean, and again, this doesn't mean that it's sinful, so I want to make sure I'm clear on this. But some people cannot go to sleep without sound. Because fear just grips them. So they have to have sound. And again, some people just like sound in the sense that they like music or something. It's relaxing. But some people live in fear and they have to have sound. They'll sleep with the television on. You know, I'll be with people. I go, why do you do that? And they go, because I'm, I'm afraid. They go, I just have to have noise. Because if I don't, I'll hear things. And, and you go, wow. I go, why not, why not, you know, again, start praying? Why not worship? Matter of fact, if you're going to do anything, at least turn on what? Worship. Praise music. Yeah, worship music, you know. Well, I mean, deal with it in a biblical fashion, in a biblical manner. It says, so Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. I mean, so he's going there going, hey, we need some, some music, not necessarily worship music, but worship music, I would really encourage you. It says, then one of the servants answered and said, look, I have seen a son of Jesse. He hangs out at the Starbucks down the street here, the Bethlehemite. And who's skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person on top of everything. He's a good-looking guy. And the Lord, he's with him. I mean, talk about an awesome description. Wouldn't you like to have that in your resume? Yeah. It says, then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. You know, and you think about this. When you find yourself, you know, church, in the, in the midst of spiritual battle, I always think of Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of God. I wouldn't first turn on the radio and start listening to praise music. What I would encourage you to do, first and foremost, is to pray. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is open up the Word of God. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And begin to utilize the Word of God in your life. If you really want to experience the peace of God, is pray, give it all the things over to the Lord, Use his word, stand on his word, and then worship the Lord. And I'll tell you what, and then that, I mean, the demons of hell, they, they hate. <laughs> they hate someone who turns to God, who rests in God, who trusts in God, who looks to God, and who worships God. If you want the devil to flee, just turn to God. Put on the full armor of God, and the devil, every time. Resist the devil, and he'll flee. It says, and Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, a skin of wine, a young goat, and sent it by his son, David, to Saul. It was a sign of respect. And it says, so David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. And again, immediately David was loved by Saul. But the reason that Saul loved David, it's interesting. Why? Because he provided something for Saul. He didn't love him because he saw the qualities of his life. He used him. I can't tell you how many people, you know, in ministry and in life and everything else, you know, as long as you're giving them something, you know, it might have me, it's not love, but I mean, they'll go, they'll love you because they're getting something from you. But as soon as they don't get something from you or it, you know, works out where there's fear of maybe you taking over, which we're going to see in David's life here, then all of a sudden they're a threat. See, he doesn't know that David's been anointed king. I mean, that's going to change everything. So he loves him because of what he's going to get from him. It says, then Saul sent to Jesse saying, please let David stand before me for he has found favor in my sight. He wanted him to come for a time, but now he wants him to stay permanently there in his house. And so it was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Again, like I said earlier, you know, because God permits something, you know, a distressing spirit to come doesn't mean that God himself carries out the deed. And so we don't blame God for that. God allows it because it's the, really, it's truly, it's the law of reaping and sowing. For whatever a man sows, that too he shall reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you will reap life. First Samuel 17, this is probably one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. David and Goliath, right? So this is sad because it's at the end of Saul's life here, and, and the Philistine army is deep now into Israeli territory here, which means they have no respect for him. They're just living in defiance of his authority as king and actually of God himself. And it says, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sokah, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Sokah and Azekah in Ephesus, uh, Domain. 
It says, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped there in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And it's great if you get to go to Israel this year. We're going in uh, February. Um, we'll actually go right here where this battle took place. Uh, neither, neither army feels like they can win the battle, so they're standing like kids on, you know, on top of two mountains, and they're yelling at each other. You know, they're, you've ever seen the thing? They hold up their swords, and they're, ah! you know, they're trying to intimidate, and they're taunting them that maybe one of them will come, because if you, if you can get them while they're coming up the hill, they're going to wear themselves out, right? So you're trying, to, you're trying to really tick off the other team so they'll come up, and they'll be wore out by the time they get to you. That's what you're trying to get them to do is to come up to you. It says, and a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So he's like what? Nine feet, like nine inches tall. He is, he is like, what do they say, a tall drink of water. It says, and he had a bronze helmet on his head. Can you imagine, let me like Jack in the Box, that, I mean, the head on that thing. It says, and his, he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. So 175, 180, 90 pounds. I mean, you you got to be one bad hombre to carry that. And that's not even counting the weight that's on his, uh, the armor around his legs. <clears throat> it says, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. So like 15, 20 pounds, just the, the spearhead. It says, and a shield bearer went before him. It says, and he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle. Am I not a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then I will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. <laughs> and you think he's confident there? I mean, that's an understatement how Goliath felt. It says, the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So he's taunting them. He's trying to humiliate them. You know, we, in, in war, we call that what? Psychological warfare. Okay, he's just beating them down. It says, and when Saul, and it worked, <laughs> and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Again, they were walking by what? Sight, not by faith. Now, David was the son of an Ephraite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were uh, Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah, and David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went, and this tells what kind of son he is, he's great, returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days morning and evening. So this battle is going on and on. And again, supplies are starting to, to wear out. And being a good dad, Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare. So he's one of you, hey, without you know, carbs, without protein, without energy, uh, they would surely lose the battle here. So he's, he's, he wants his sons home. It says, and see how your brothers fare and bring back the news of them. And now Saul and all they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning. You know, when they say fighting, <laughs> It wasn't hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was, neener, neener, neener. You know, they were, they were just taunting one another from across the valley. It says, and you can actually, if you go there, you can stand on one hill and then and get people to stand on the other, and you can hear each other. That's what's so amazing about it. You can literally stand there and see it for yourself. It says, and he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for battle. It says, for Israel... And the Philistines had drawn up battle array, army against army, and, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was a champion, the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. So Israel's been hearing this for 40 days, right? And they're living in fear. David hears this for the very first time, and man, he's... He's moved by faith. And it says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen the man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give him his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. 
He'll give him an offshore account there. It says, And then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the approach from Israel? It wasn't that David didn't hear it. He's going, Are you guys lying to me? You know, because he's the, he's, the, he's the baby of the family. Are you guys tricking me here? It says, Who kills this Philistine and takes away the approach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So again, David, again, he's not in it for stuff. Right away, what is he in? He's in it for the honor of God. He's not really concerned about all the things that he could get out of. I mean, he, he, all he makes mention of is the Lord himself. Nobody else makes mention of God, only David. They're all concerned about stuff. The king will give you stuff. And he's going, wait a second, these guys are defying the true and the living God. That's what incensed David. That's what David wanted to rectify there. He was offended by what the giant was doing. The fact that he was in the land, again, is what upset David. It says, and the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Wow. You know, why, why was Eliab, why was he saying those things? Because he was being a coward. And he saw, what? Courage. He saw faith in David, and it convicted him. You know, sometimes when people attack people, it's because, again, it's the fear in their own life. It's not the fact that they, you know, see the truth. They recognize the fact that, you know, he knew that David was walking in faith. You know, Jesus himself said, you know, a prophet is not without honor except where? In his own town, in his hometown. Sometimes it's going to be the people closest to you that are going to do the most damage. It says, and David said, what have I done now? <laughs> it's like, so this wasn't the first time that his brothers accused him of something. Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another, and he said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. So everybody's pushing in on it. And again, I, I'm always reminded of what Paul would tell Timothy. Don't let anyone look down upon you because you're young. So if you're a young person here, it's like you have the same opportunities to serve the Lord. But be an example in faith and love and purity towards one another. It says, Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And he sent for him. Then Saul, uh, David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go up and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. So what David is declaring is, my past has prepared me. No matter what your past is, it has prepared you for what God has for you today. David knew that God would be with him. He knew that God was with him when he slew a lion, when he slew a bear. All he was going, hey, he goes, this uncircumcised Philistine, he's just a big lion. Or he's just a big bear. That's, that's what he's declaring. And again, it's such a, a beautiful picture here. See, each of us have, and this might seem scary for you tonight, but uh, we all have a bigger giant in front of us. But that's okay, because whatever you're going through, you know, whatever God brings you to, he will see you through. And that's where we have to rest in. It says, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me. So he wasn't saying, I'll do this. He wasn't being proud at all. He had tremendous faith in the living God, in the living God says, from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. You know what's so amazing about that statement right there? Everybody had fear in their heart up to this very moment. But faith produces what? Faith. So all of a sudden, Saul's response was in faith. All of a sudden, that's the good thing. If you'll step out in faith and you'll be a person of faith, guess what will happen? You will encourage other people to become people of faith. Don't let them pull you down. Be the one who pulls them up. It says, so Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on a bronze helmet on his head. He clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk. You can try to picture this. You know, 
It says, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk in these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. See, you know one of the things I want to encourage you tonight? Be yourself. You don't have to be somebody else. God created you. You are a flake. You're a snowflake. You're, and what I mean by that is, you know, you, there's no two snowflakes that are exactly alike, right? It's just like you have fingerprints. They're not alike. Just be who God called you to be. We are so pressed in. You know, the Bible is telling us the world is trying to do what? Conform us into an image. Buy this. Do this. Go here. Do, live here. Eat this. You know, drive this. Wear this. Do this. And it's just pushing. You go, it's just be who God called you to be. Know that he's with you. That he's in you. It says that he took uh, his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. People go, Five, why five stones? Most of you know. We don't know this. I mean, it's, you know, we think, well, Goliath had, what, four brothers? We know from Scripture. Or was Goliath, or was David just afraid that, you know, he might miss with the first one and needed some more? I, I believe that he believed that once he took Goliath down, Goliath's brothers were going to step in, and he was ready to do battle against them. So he took the stones from the brook, and he put them into a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was a youth, ruddy and good-looking. This, I mean, you, here you are... The, the challenge, they sent out a little kid to fight you. Talk about mocking somebody. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come out to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. What is he saying? You're no match for God. Oh, you're a match for me. You know, that doesn't mean David's knees weren't knocking, okay? <laughs> I mean, you look at it, he's going, you know, if it's me and him, I'm going down. You know, but if it's, if it's God versus Goliath, then I'm going up. And that's exactly how he went. It says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. I mean, so to think of those rocks, you know, when did God create the rocks? You know, a few thousand years earlier, he creates these rocks and places them there, you know, in a riverbed. Hey, you know, you imagine him talking to the angels of heaven because everything God does is in the, with an eternal perspective. That's why if God explained everything about your life, you wouldn't even get it because there's things that are happening in me and you today that are still yet to be lived out even generations from now. That's what's so amazing that a, that a wise man does what? He leaves an inheritance to his children's what? Children. That your investment isn't just in your own life, but man, it's, it's way on ahead. So you imagine God talking to the angels in heaven? Hey, uh, make sure you put some really nice, smooth stones down there in that creek bed. They're like, why? He goes, oh, David's going to need them in about 2,500 years from now. You imagine the angels in heaven going, okay, we'll just do what we're told to do. I mean, it's just, it's amazing when you think about how God operates. It wasn't by chance, it's by what? Design. He's a creator, right? We, we, Love the creator. And again, and what he does with creation is just simply amazing. It says, So it was when the Philistines arose and they came and drew near to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, one stone. He slung it, struck the Philistine in the forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. I mean, he was dead before he even hit the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine <coughs> and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and look, what he had to do. I and mean, this is how fast, he mean, Goliath went down. Drew it out of its sheath. And Goliath didn't even have time to get his sword out. That's how fast God works. It says he killed him and then he cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. People go, why did he cut the, his head off? Well, 
if they just saw Goliath go down, you're talking about on top of a hill. They might not know exactly what was taking place, but if you cut a guy's heads off, head off and you hold it up for everybody to see, I think we've had a separation of church and state that's taken place there, and I think that they, they start to recognize that. And so it says, Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley of the gates of Ekron, and wound, the wounded of the Philistines fell on the road to Sharam, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine, brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. And the reason he's asking is because he's made a promise, right, that you're going to get to marry my daughter. So he's, he's going, well, whoever this is, he's becoming family. So we better, we better understand this. Said, so as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And so David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, of the Bethlehemite. And so again, as you look at this, you know, there, there's such an um, amazing story here. And the thing is, I know it's 8.32, and I want to just close with this. I want you to, to think about something with me. We're all going to face giants in our life. This isn't just a story that's just a cute little kid story here. And just real quickly, just in closing, there's things, you know, as I, I go through this, and I mean, I'm always reminded, you know, how, how do you defeat the giants in your life. And maybe you're here tonight, you know, and it's a great night for you because you go, Pastor Mike, if you knew the giant that I'm facing tonight, and I want you to just think about this with me. And I put this in my notes here. You know, if you want to defeat your giants, number one is face your giants, don't deny them. See, the world has a way. I just, just, just no. There, there really were giants in the land, but they can be defeated. And what you have to ask yourself when I say that you've got to face your giants is you've got to look at this in such a way as see them for what they really are. Maybe it's fear, doubt, worry, you know, whatever the thing is, you know, anger, you know, pride, ego, bitterness. You can make your own list here, but you've got to face that giant. And the key here then, the second thing is you want to study the benefits Think about that tonight. Whatever that giant is in your life, study the benefits of that giant being gone. How different would your life be? And again, don't focus on what could happen. Like, if you don't win, you know, focus on, you know, what your life will be like without this giant in your life and the freedom that you'll experience, the hope that you have in Jesus. And then most important, See the giant as God's problem. See, when David, he didn't say that the giant was his problem. He recognized that the battle was whose? It's the Lord's. See, we make it personal. Every sin that's committed, even if somebody's sinning against you, they're not sinning against you truly. They're sinning against God. All sin is against God. We personalize so much of it you know, in our lives. See, we need to see the giants as God's problem. See, it's his enemy. It's not just your enemy. See, what was Goliath doing? He was defying what? The living God. It's God's problem. So take your giant, take your problem tonight, take it to God. Give him the strength. Number four, remember that the giants are in your life. They're there after God as much as they're after you. And the reason why, it's because you're a follower of God. See, the giants of your life, they're enemies of God. They're trying, those, whatever those things are in your life, they're trying to defy God in your life. First Samuel 17, 47, you know, it reminds us that that's true. The battle is whose? It's the Lord's. It's not my battle. It's not your battle. See, when all was said and done, David, he believed in one giant and one giant only, and that was a giant God. You know, I love to remind people, don't focus on the size of your problem, focus on the size of your God. Man, we focus on the wrong thing so much of the time, and it rips us off. God's bigger than all your fears. We need to trust him.
And then the last thing I send you out with tonight is, you know, use God's weapons, not your own. I mean, willpower isn't going to defeat the devil in your life. I think I can. I think I can. You know, no. It's not going to. Hard work isn't going to defeat the devil in your life. Only God working in you and only God working through you will defeat the giants in your life. And what are the weapons again? Prayer, the Word of God. You think about you know all the things that He's given us: fellowship, you know, communion with God, all kinds of things. You think about you know, confession, forgiveness, loving, walking by faith, not walking by sight. You know, go to Ephesians six. You know, for yourself, put on the full armor of God. Walk in it and experience the victory. Overcome evil with good. Walk in truth and the battle's yours. You'll win. Don't give up. Don't walk by faith. Man, if you go out there and you start you walk by faith, don't walk by sight. You, you look at that giant in your life and you focus on that giant, it'll take you down every time. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. Do not focus on the size of your problem. Focus on the size of your God and watch what God does for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.